Athens. It's wonderful to be here in Ilri once again, and one, wonderful to be with friends uh, uh, who uh, many of them no I've known for a very long time. I want to give a little bit of an overview of some of the questions and some of the challenges that we face in this, this area that we've come together to discuss, just to set the scene uh, for the workshop. As we all know, over the last decades, there have been huge investments in trying to address disasters in the dry lands of Eastern Africa or the Greater Horn. You only have to travel around northern Kenya, as we have been doing over the last few weeks, to see signs of numerous projects that focus on drought, on livelihoods, on social protection, on resilience, and many more. Indeed, under Kenya's Vision 2030 program, the government laid out an ambitious plan to end drought emergencies by 2022. But of course, it's 2024 now. And as Bonnie mentioned, the region has been through one of the worst droughts this century and is only beginning to start the process of recovery. So what's gone wrong or what's going wrong? Are policies and practices that we have been pushing seem not to be making their mark? There seems to be, as Peter mentioned, a disconnect. So maybe we need to rethink how we go about these processes of early warning, anticipatory action, humanitarian response, and resilience building. Everyone uses those words, but what do we mean by them? And how do we rethink them in a way that actually they might have some impact? As has already been mentioned by Rachma, the, the, the workshop brings together three different projects, all at the early stages of implementation, and all are committed to interrogating this disconnect from different angles. And this workshop, as Rachma said, is, is an attempt to try and link this, the projects, make connections, but more importantly, make connections with all of you as other researchers, policymakers, NGO practitioners, and others so that we can work on this together as a joint effort. Because I think the task is urgent. Millions of dollars are spent each year on humanitarian aid and emergency responses alongside the many development projects, building early warning systems, developing insurance products, planning irrigation schemes, implementing countless resilience projects. But we have to ask together as a community, honestly and openly, if these efforts genuinely are building resilience in the dry lands. So that people are building their capacities to avert disasters, sustain livelihoods, and rebuild after inevitable shocks arise. So I think there are a number of challenges that we all must face. And I hope we can discuss some of these in this workshop. First, I think we need to, to ask, what is the system we're working with? In the dry lands, this is often pastoralism, a complex system involving mobile livestock, as we all know, often involving connections with trade, with agriculture and other activities. But rather than us thinking of what's sometimes called alternative livelihoods, getting out of pastoralism, as some of these projects aim to do, how can resilience be built within this system with pastoralism at the core? Because pastoralism is central to most people's livelihoods, even if it fluctuates in its importance for different people at different times. And this will be the case for the foreseeable future. The end of pastoralism has often been proclaimed, but pastoralism persists. Pastoralism is a, an important livelihood, even if the form of pastoralism, as we know, changes. So we need a better understanding, a better knowledge of fast changing pastoral systems and to banish forever some of the myths about pastoralism that have plagued policy making in the dry lands since the colonial era. And that those myths and misperceptions, I think, affect the way we frame projects and frame interventions in the dry lands and result in some of these disconnects and some of these failures I talked about. Second, I think we need to think about how droughts and other disasters are seen on the ground and from the ground. These aren't just single events predicted that can be predicted and managed as risk. 
but they emerge from complex systems. They're always uncertain. We don't know about the probabilities of the outcomes of any particular combination of events. And they're always compounding and combining. Disasters and emergencies are seen very often from the offices as singular, as moments where an emergency response must be organized. But if you sit on the ground and you look at emergencies, then the time and the framing of these looks very much different. And of course, they combine. Some people just work on drought. Some people just work on conflict. Others work on diseases. But if you're a pastoralist, uh, you are having to confront these all the time. A drought is much worse if there is conflict, excluding your capacity to go to a certain rangeland. Livelihoods are much more constrained in certain areas if land is being grabbed, and so on. So rather than assuming that we can develop a simple technical fix, a satellite early warning information system, a uh, an insurance product, an irrigation scheme, or whatever, we need to think how such interventions work in the system with, that we're thinking about, in context. The same goes for humanitarian and emergency relief. Of course, there are key moments when, when external support through cash transfers or food aid is essential. But especially when programs persist over time, as many do, we must ask how they can link to longer term development and build not undermine resilience, as, too, as they too often do. And third, we, we need to ask how reliability is generated in such variable, uncertain settings so that disasters are averted on the ground. Droughts, floods, conflicts, diseases, market crashes, and combinations of all of the above are not going to go away. And with climate change, of course, variability will only increase. So as we learn from other studies of so-called critical infrastructures, where the supply of essential goods and services must be assured, it's the professionals in the system and their networks that are at the heart of, uh, of making sure reliability is assured. But too often there are disconnects, again, arise because external experts arrive, donor agencies, relief agencies, NGOs, government officials and others, and think they have the solution. But actually reliability can only be generated by working closely with the women and men on the ground who continuously must manage grazing, assure water supplies, keep the peace, transport products to markets, supply emergency fodder, and so on. All of these activities are essential, but understanding how this is done, by whom, when, through what relationships, with which resources, is vitally important for building resilience from below. And further, we must ask how such practices can be supported, shared, and extended, rather than overlooking these practices and imposing alternative solutions that don't mesh with the system that we're trying to support. So we should avoid arri arriving at another resilience project, another alternative livelihood project, another emergency intervention that diverts the energies, the focus, and unnecessarily takes up people's time and focus on building reliability at the center of uh, people's systems, building resilience from below. So those three things are challenges. There are many more. But I hope our discussions today, we can begin to unpack some of the policy practices, practice disconnects in early warning, anticipatory action, humanitarian response, and resilience building, but particularly the connections between all of them, and get to grips with why we have so often failed. But perhaps more importantly, think together how we can do better in the future. So thank you. Thank you.